What's going on, man? Welcome back to the basement, Amron. And today I did the tedious task of sitting down and going through every meaningful player all the way to the Dwayne Eskridges and the two two Atwells of the world. And I charted every player in my database from the 2021 draft class. I charted their RS grade, their year one production, and kind of came up with sophomore comps. And now that sounds a little bit weird. So let's show you guys Jamar Chase just as an example whose comps are silly. Based off of his year one production, we have Julio Jones, AJ Green, Odell Beckham, and Justin Jefferson as his sophomore comps. Now, I promise you, Dwayne Eskridge and Ramondre Stevenson and guys that are that late do not look like this in the sophomore comps database, but I wanted to show you guys, give you guys a little bit of a sneak peek. The guys on uh, Patreon, patreon.com slash Ron Stewart, get access to my complete RS grade library, which is my RS grades for the 2022 class, my RS grades going back for every position, every player drafted since 2007, my rookie comps, my sophomore comps, my year three comps. I pour my heart and soul onto the back end of that discord, onto the back end of the Patreon. So make sure you go check that out. So I decided I would give you guys a little bit of a sneak peek today. And I'd sit down and talk about some of these sophomore comps, you know, the ones that I, I put together and they really stood out to me as I mean, maybe not, I wouldn't even say shocking, but just ones that stood out to me. And then based on their sophomore comps, we can talk about if they are buys or sells in the eyes of the market based on their year two comparable players. So with that being said, if you enjoy the video, make sure you go down below, subscribe, leave a like, let's go. Thirsty, thirsty, try to choose. I mean, I know I'm critical. My nitty all right, so first up, we got Amon Ra St. Brown. He is going at the wide receiver 25 at the 702 in startup drafts right now. And these sophomore comps for him are sexy, man. We got Stephon Diggs, Cooper Cup, Brandon Ayuk, Eddie Royal. That's where you kind of get the downside. Obviously, he's not going to be a bulletproof stud, will hit 1,000%, but his comps are pretty solid. You have McLaurin in there as well. And Amon Ra St. Brown feels eerily similar to Brandon Ayuk at this time last year in a good way this time last year Brandon Ayuk was coming off a strong year one good PFF receiving grade and he was getting valued around like the wide receiver 12 to 15 range in dynasty Amon Ross St. Brown has essentially the same prospect profile I know that Ayuk was a first rounder and Amon Ross St. Brown was a, sec uh, a fourth rounder but in the eyes of dynasty and rookie drafts they both went around the same spots of rookie drafts in their draft classes and you only you can buy Ayuk again, who was a good process bet as a top 15 wide receiver. You can now pretty much make the same bet at wide receiver 25. So for me, in my rankings on my top 250, I have every player or my positional rankings, I have every player listed as either neutral, hard sell, soft sell, neutral, soft buy, hard buy. I have Amon Ross St. Brown as a hard buy. And I think that the reason why we're getting him at such a discount is one, because of the fourth round draft capital, which I guess I understand. But we're running into this fallacy of targets being given and not earned. You know, people believe that because Hawkinson and DeAndre Swift were hurt during Amon Ross St. Brown's 25 point per game stretch from weeks 13 to 18, we should just throw that out and say, you know, he was just a product of a situation he produced because there was no one else there. Now, I, I am promising you guys, I don't know if it's going to be May, June, July, there will be a, you know, similar to last year when we did that T Higgins breakdown video and the DeAndre Swift breakdown video. There will be an Amon Ross St. Brown deep dive into his prospect profile, what I think he's going to do in year two and his dynasty value moving forward. But as of right now, I think he's vastly underrated. Now, again, with this whole target competition thing, you don't just put up 25 points per game in a six game stretch as a rookie if you're not talented. I don't know what I got on the side of my mouth right now. That's my bad. Um, but target competition is i think largely overrated for these rookie wide receivers you have jalen rager brian edwards Nikhil harry andy isabella all went to empty wide receiver rooms as rookies and they all did nothing right the in the nfl there's three wide receivers on the field most of the time you don't need to walk into an empty wide receiver room to produce it's not like running back if you're on the field and you're running routes that's all you need to happen and when we look at, you know, these crowded wide receiver rooms and, and wide receivers like Nikhil Harry, Jalen Rager, Brian Edwards, they were all propped up because they walked into empty wide receiver rooms. Whereas on the flip side, you have Justin Jefferson and Jamar Chase putting up historic rookie seasons next to Adam Thielen, T. Higgins, same with CeeDee Lamb, a guy that I'm not even super high on. I admit he is very good at football. 
And he did that next to Amari Cooper and Michael Gallup. So when you draft a rookie, you're betting on their talent. And if they're good, they're going to demand the targets. That's truly what it comes down to. If they're good, they will demand the targets regardless of who is in their wide receiver room. I cannot stress that enough. The idea that, you know, we're propping up guys like Alan Lazard because there's no one in his wide receiver room and guys like Marcus Valdez-Scantling this far out, it's a fool's errand, fellas. There's, there, in, in football, targets are earned. Just because you are the only wide receiver on the field does not mean that you're going to be relevant. Now, with Amon Ross St. Brown, he did earn targets. He had a 21.4% target share on a 24.7 target rate, which means on a per route basis, he was earning targets at a 24.7% rate. That was actually lagging behind his 21.4% target share, which means he was earning routes at a high rate, but he wasn't getting the full route participation as a rookie, which is common. Rookies don't get onto the field 100% of the time, 100% of the snaps, or 100% of the route participation from day one. It takes a it takes a while. We see wide receivers come on on the back half of seasons. That's where we had last year, Jalen Waddle down the stretch. Elijah Moore didn't pop until the end. You had the year before that, Ayuk didn't pop until the end. Same thing with um, Justin Jefferson didn't pop like the first four weeks. He wasn't even he didn't even get a full route participation as a rookie in week one, Justin Jefferson. Same thing can be said for, for an A.J. Brown the year before that when he popped off like the last eight weeks. Same thing with Debo Samuel in that class. So knocking him for not earning routes until injuries happen, I think is a little bit is a little bit too crucial on a day three rookie. Then, you know, as soon as he got those routes, he dominated, not only produced great on the field, and it's not like his targets were empty and the points per game were empty. He looked good on film too. He had an 80 PFF grade, which is huge. PFF doesn't just give 80 plus grades out. Waddle only had a 78.5. I believe Elijah Moore had like a 73.5. Amon Ross St. Brown had the second highest receiving grade in this class with an 80. Anything over 80 in terms of receiving grade is really, really good. As you guys can see here, Stephon Diggs had a 78.5. Cup, 78.5. Ayuk had an 80.8. You have Terry McLaurin at 86.5. You don't just get really good PFF grades passed out to you, especially as a day three guy. So... I think now that he's probably going to have a, a full route participation, he's going to be a great buy. And the PFF grade, the targets, everything he produces, why his soft comps look as good as they do. Diggs, Cooper Cup, Terry McLaurin as his ceiling outcomes, which I think are all pretty fair. I would advise you to buy now, right? This whole idea is that you should be buying Amon Ross St. Brown. But I think that you could probably get him for cheaper if they draft a wide receiver, which I imagine they will, whether that's going to be, uh, you know, an Olave or a Pickens or a Jahan Dotson or 32, maybe a Christian Watson around there. If they bring any wide receiver in, I think that that wide receiver 25 price might even go to like wide receiver 30, wide receiver 35. So I would honestly wait until after the draft and then strike. Now, give me a second. I'm going to pause this and I'm going to come back. All right. Your boy had to go pee real quick, but our second wide receiver here, or not wide receiver, but our second buy is going to be Trey Lance. And I actually have him listed as a buy slash hold because it's super difficult to call a guy that has a second round startup pick ADP. Right now he's going at the 205 as the QB9 in drafts right now. So to list him as a firm buy is tough because you're not going to really be able to, like he is one of the guys where guys that are just in that top two rounds of startup drafts, there's a lot more friction when you're trying to buy those players. So it's hard to call him a must buy, but if you can acquire Trey Lance, I'd be into it. And his soft comps look, amazing. Andrew Luck, Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson, Kyler Murray, Marcus Mariota. Really solid list. Now, in terms of, you know, just upside of the quarterback position, I think that there's no other quarterback I'd really want to bet on. Um, he's, in my opinion, the favorite from, if you're talking about quarterbacks outside of the top six of Josh Allen, Mahomes, Lamar Jackson, Kyler, Herbert, Deshaun Watson, I think that he has the best chance in a year from now of being in that top six you know, next off season. And he has the build that has a ton of upside in fantasy. He is an elite Konami code QB, which is what five of the top six QBs are. All of the top six QBs I listed besides Justin Herbert were elite Konami code QBs in college. And that Konami code type upside showed in his three starts last year. He averaged 18 points per game and he averaged over 50 rushing yards per game. So he is going to be at the very least Jalen Hurts. What we need now for Trey Lance to make that next step is for him to show us that he is an NFL caliber thrower of the football, you know, average to above average, even in that Lamar Jackson range would be good. And it's tough for me to make a stand on either side of that. I think I think we can kind of all come to an agreement that it would have to be a leap, right? 
Um, but there's definitely some signal that he could make that step right now. The biggest thing that's going for him is that 8.6 adjusted yards per attempt. So as you guys can see, that's right here by far the highest. The problem is, is that that is only on a three game sample. And on the opposite side of the argument, he has the lowest, uh, clean pocket PFF pass grade of this group. He only had 57.7% completion percentage. So it's hard to make a stand either way, but his throwing wasn't bad enough to say that he can't do it. And his throwing wasn't good enough to saying for sure he will take that jump. So I think that because of that, he has in his range of outcomes being, you know, Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson, Kyler Murray. But I also think just because of his rushing, his floor outcome is probably Jalen Hurts, Marcus Mariota, where I think at worst we get a top 12 season or two from him just on rushing production alone. And if he's not a good quarterback, he probably gets fr uh, flushed out, which I think is fine. Um, we had signal in college too that he's a good thrower of the football, 28 touchdowns, zero interceptions. If he is that guy and he's as good at throwing the football as advertised in school, then we're looking at a Josh Allen type guy. And I think that he's also a good bet because if he starts trending towards Mariota slash like Jalen Hurts and he's not that good in real life and he has throwing problems, I think still just because he probably should still be hovering around top 12 quarterback, like he could have a 20 point per game season and still have long term questions in terms of is, is he a good quarterback? I think at that point, you could just move off of him and pivot. You probably lose a round or two of startup value, but it's really not a big loss. Whereas the asymmetrical upside of having the next Kyler, Lamar, Deshaun Watson in the second round of a startup draft is huge. So he's a guy that if I have him on a team, I am not selling him for anything. If I can get into buying him, I'm very much into that. If I can go from like, if I can go from Trevor Lawrence into Trey Lance, I'd, much, I'd really be into that. If I could go for Justin Field into Trey Lance, I'd be into that. I'm trying to think of other other move if I go to Mac Jones into Trey Lance I'd be into that I'm trying to think of those like uh high caliber quarterbacks that I'm really not a big fan of if I could go Tua Tua plus like a a mid to late first for Trey Lance I think that that would be good too um the only time that I'd be looking to sell Trey Lance if I could tear up at quarterback and get into Kyler Lamar Deshaun without having to give up too too much but still even then really wouldn't be wanting to move off of him if you have him keep him if you don't I don't mind trying to take a Tua or something like that you know tear up at quarterback now while we're talking about 2021 QBs, this I know this is a loaded screenshot, and I'll, I'll talk about it in a second. I probably actually should have sort of broke down what's on the sophomore comp uh, screenshots earlier, so I'll do that now. But we're, I want to highlight two 2021 quarterbacks that stood out to me, and we have Trevor Lawrence and Zach Wilson. And on these comps, you could see here prospect info is just like draft pick, draft year, their name, their prospect here, which is elite, their archetype, which is like how much do they rush. Clean PFF pass grade, I think that that's pretty... Uh, standard. That's just their pass grade when they have a clean pocket. So you can kind of take pressure and battle line situation out of the equation. Adjusted yards per attempt, one of the better quarterback stats we have. And then fantasy points per game. Then you just have like their, you know, how many seasons that the people in the, their comp list have that are in the top five, 12 or 24. And then my model output, which is their RS grade, which is a grade from zero to 10. How good is that player going to be? Now, the reason that I have Zach Wilson and Trevor Lawrence here because they spit out pretty much the same sophomore comps. Um, they both have pretty much, you're pretty much looking at in terms of just like mean median projection, we're looking at Stafford, Wentz, Sam Bradford, which seems about right, which is just kind of a, you know, back end quarterback one solid starter. But at this point, two guys that were drafted, especially Trevor Lawrence, Trevor Lawrence was drafted to eventually be a top six a asset in dynasty, just like we think that Trey Lance could be. You know, he was being drafted last year at like the 107, 108. I'm not sure he still has that in his range of outcomes. I think it's the very upper, upper 99th, 100th percentile outcome at this point. Um, but when you just compare Zach Wilson to Trevor Lawrence, and this is not me saying that Trevor Lawrence is worse than Zach Wilson. I get why Trevor Lawrence is ahead, but I just wanted to point out how close they look like in terms of uh, sophomore comps. And when you just compare the three metrics I look at and clean PFF pass grade, Wilson had a better clean PFF pass grade. He had a better adjusted yards per attempt and better points per game than Trevor Lawrence. All just barely. But I think a two and a half round difference in ADP where Trevor Lawrence is the 302 as the quarterback 12 and Zach Wilson is the 509 as the quarterback 20. I think that's probably inefficient. I think Trevor Lawrence should probably be... I mean, I have him pretty high on my rankings too, and it's tough because he's such a good, uh, he was such a good prospect. He was one of only three prospects in my database. If you look at the RS grades, this is where it also gets a little bit hairy because if you look at the RS grades, Trevor Lawrence, even though they're all elite, Trevor Lawrence has a, by far the best RS grade. He's a 9.14. The only quarterbacks in my database to have above a nine RS grade are Joe Burrow, Cam Newton, and Trevor Lawrence. Also sneak peek, 
for all the Devi guys out there, we have Devi stuff available on the Patreon coming soon. Caleb Williams is also a nine plus RS grade. I'm very excited for Caleb Williams in that 2024 class, but it's so tough, man, because Cam Newton and Joe Burrow as rookies, they both flashed and looked really good. Cam Newton, I think he set the record for like most rushing touchdowns as a rookie and Trevor Lawrence and Joe Burrow looked great as a rookie. He averaged, I want to say like in the 18 points per game range is what we're really looking for. I just, it's, it's really tough for Trevor Lawrence because you either have to take a leap of faith and really trust that prospect profile after what played out last year. It's tough. It's tough. You can either, you can close your eyes and trust it, or at a, at a certain point, you kind of just have to expect, you know, Stafford is probably the reasonable outcome for him, which at the 302 in drafts doesn't feel like there's a ton of room for profit. That's probably right about where he should be going. I think that Andrew Luck was, you know, his ceiling outcome, maybe even his median projection coming out of the draft. I think, again, 99th, 100th percentile outcome at this point. I think Andrew Luck would be, is very far gone at this point because you, Trevor Lawrence, he came in here. And at least Andrew Luck, he threw, I think that he threw a bunch of interceptions as a rookie and he was kind of all over the place. But at the very least, Andrew Luck averaged like 18 points per game in fantasy as a rookie. Trevor Lawrence gave us nothing last year. And the other thing that I'm a little bit scared of with Trevor Lawrence is, I don't think people are really talking about it. And somebody on Twitter that is a really good follow at a Nelly Lytics, uh, Nelly on there. Trevor Lawrence probably has about four to six more weeks of insulation, guys. He was, again, remember, he was a early round two guy. He is now only a 302 guy, not a huge drop off after a pretty disappointing season. Again, he had the identical season to Zach Wilson, essentially. And if we go four to six weeks into the season and Trevor Lawrence still sucks and there's no sign of him turning it around, he starts to plummet. I think if you if we get through four to six weeks and Trevor Lawrence is not putting up and he's still outside of like the top you know if he's still like a fringe QB2 in that like 13 14 15 points per game range he's using up all of his mulligans he is now a you know instead of a 302 guy he probably falls to like 405 and then 505 512 into the six range it gets very very it gets very very scary if he goes out there and he doesn't at least put up solid like Six, if he puts up like a 15, 16, 17 points per game, we're probably looking okay. But again, if he goes out there and he face plans, it gets really ugly. So I don't have Trevor Lawrence listed as a sell on the rankings, but I think he's not a guy that I want to be acquiring in trade. If I have him, I'm maybe holding on to him. But if I can turn Trevor Lawrence into, I would actually, I think I'll probably end up tweaking Trevor Lawrence to a soft sell. If I can sell Trevor Lawrence into, you know, Trevor Lawrence in a plus into Russell Wilson, Trey Lance, Kyler Murray, Lamar Jackson, even a, a Dak Prescott. I think I'd be into that at this point. It gets it gets really ugly with Trevor Lawrence. And on the flip side of that, I actually love Zach Wilson at his price. I think that Stafford and Wentz, you know, in these comps is pretty fair. I think Mitch Trubisky is probably the floor. I don't mind that type of swing at 509 at all because if Zach Wilson does hit and he is Stafford or he is Wentz, people forget Wentz through like two years was like really good. Or year one sucked. Year two, Carson Wentz was really special. So if Zach Wilson can be anything in that range, he probably goes from like 509 in startups to late second, early third, mid third. So I think that there is profit to be had on Zach Wilson. I actually have him as, I believe, either a soft buy or a hard buy. So I like Wilson as a buy. I lean sell on Trevor Lawrence. If you want to if you want to hold and you want to see it through and you believe, okay, 9.14 RS grade, he's up there with Burrow and Cam Newton as prospects. And um, Urban Meyer just really played last year. I wouldn't blame you for it. Again, I think that he's a decent hold, but if I could sell him for a much more proven quarterback or a Trey Lance, I would do that all day long. Now, next up, we're going to talk about Rondell Moore. And he is a he is so tough for me, man, in terms of just ranking and just how to feel about him going into year two. And he's going at the 1104 as the wide receiver 49. I'm not sure he's a buy or sell, but I think at the very least, at the 1104, he's not super expensive. So I think saying that he's a sell is probably the wrong way to go about things because what are you really getting for the 1104? You're getting pretty much nothing. I will say though, if I can go from like Rondale, if I can do like Rondale on a third for Kadarius Tony, I would do that all day long. Um, but with Rondale Moore, the community is just really soured on him. And at this point, I think that you probably just have to hold and see unless you get an offer that really blows you away. I know that a lot of the guys in um, Bean Counters Discord uh, like Rondale Moore to bounce back. I'm not as bullish as them. I think at this point, he's trending towards face planner. The market is not a big fan of him. We've talked about this last year about face planners. I'll probably revive it or yeah, re revive like the face planner video once we get our official face planners for 2021. But 
for a guy that the community's per- soured on pretty heavily, his peripherals weren't that bad. He had 7.79 points per game, a 14% target share in a limited role with only 52.8% target sh- or route participation. So he's only participating in 50% of routes, but still getting a 14% target share, which is really solid. And I think that it becomes a two-sided thing because on one one hand, he was commanding targets, right? 14% target share on 52.8% of the routes is actually really good. The problem is he was sort of buried on a depth chart behind DeAndre Hopkins, which is fine. But D-Hop was hurt a lot last year. And he was kind of in a limited role behind AJ Green and Christian Kirk, which isn't the best look in the world. And again, Rondo Moore is this conundrum for me where we have to ding him for not being able to move up in a depth chart with AJ Green and Christian Kirk. But he also commanded targets when he was on the field. On a per route basis, he had a 26.2% target rate, which was actually higher than Amon Ross St. Brown's 24.7%. That's really strong. The only drawbacks on that is that they were schemed, you know, low A dot type touches, gadgety type touches, 3.3 A dot. So he was kind of force fed that 26.2% target rate. And a lot of the times if he was on the field, it was because he was getting schemed a touch. So I don't want to pump up that 26.2% target rate too, too much. I doubt that he gets in that range, but I think in a full-time role, if he can just play 80% or more of the rounds, he's probably looking at like 17 to 17, 18% target share which is fine. He probably settles in around the like wide receiver three, wide receiver four guy in that sense in year two, you know, with Christian Kirk gone. I think the, the question really just becomes, does he get a full-time route participation? The main drawback is that the Cardinals probably draft a wide receiver or they, they maybe draft a wide receiver. They bring in a Burks, they bring in a Jamison Williams, they bring in a Drake London, whoever in the first round, or even if they go with like a Sky Moore in the second, it gets pretty ugly for, for Rondell Moore. He starts trending into that Andy Isabella territory. Um, but again, these, these comps, I haven't even talked about the comps, but they, they highlight a really wide range of outcomes. You have Deandre Hopkins, Alshon Jeffrey, Sidney Rice at the top, but at the bottom, you have guys like Jalen Rager, Dante Pettis, which I think is actually kind of a good comp for him. Doriel Green Beckham. I don't even know who Vincent Brown is. Leonard Hankerson. It gets really ugly. I think gun to my head. I think gun to my head of this list. He is probably Tyler Boyd. You know, just a really good slot wide receiver that probably gives you a couple top 24 wide receiver seasons, which is fine at his price of like 11th round startup pick. But again, I probably lean hold their buy with Rondo more, but I think it was interesting to know. I, I think, again, it, I mean, it depends on how you feel about Rondo more as a prospect. If, if you have him as instead of gold and you have him as like elite and you can take away the silvers on this list, Complice doesn't look that bad, but the the model doesn't like him as much as other people do um but again ronda moore has a very wide range of outcomes i think it's a little bit naive to say that deandre hopkins or alshon jeffrey are in his range of outcomes or even kenny Britt, just as guys that were much bigger and had much higher a dots and just won in different ways so i do like tyler boyd i think you know like solid slot wide receiver is fine for him again i don't think he's a screaming buy i don't think he's a must sell at his price uh again if i could pivot off of him into Kadarius tony or any of the top five picks in this draft like if I could do Rondell in a second for like the 105, I would do that all day long. I don't think you I don't think you can really get that deal though in most leagues, but yeah. So last up we have Travis Etienne. And I, I wanted to highlight Travis Etienne here because even though I compiled four comps for him, I don't think that there are, are really any comps for Etienne. And I think the biggest positive on his profile at this point is that I don't think he's going to face plant. I think he's pretty much held value at this point. Right now in startups, he's going at the 412 as the RB12. It's pretty wild that after not taking a single snap, as you guys can see, zero points per game, zero target share, he's still a top 12 back in Dynasty. Um, so I, again, this is uh, I know that this is going to be a must buy or sell video, but it really is just more sophomore comp oriented. So it's tough for me to call ETN a buy or a sell. I think I lean, I think I lean sell at 412. You know, you could probably get, I, I would sell him for any top five rookie pick, any random 23 first, any wide receiver in that Deontay uh, Johnson, DJ Moore range. I'd probably buy him for any first. That's where Brees Hall, Malik Willis, Traylon Burks, Garrett Wilson, and Drake London are off the board. So I think that that would be what? One, two, three, four. So 106 or later, I would buy. I don't think you're going to get that price in a lot of places. 105 or earlier, I would be selling. 2023 first i'd be selling deontay johnson dj moore i'd be selling now his comps cj spiller richard mendenhall david wilson i have a hard time taking these names seriously as his actual comps because none of these guys 
were hurt, or I mean, David Wilson was hurt, but none of these guys had a complete zero in year one. All of them just played poorly. So I think it's hard to assume that just because Travis Etienne had a zero across the board, that we should be putting him in a bucket of guys that played poorly in year one. I think that he probably comps a little bit better to a guy like Rashad Penny, but Rashad Penny was a much worse prospect. He was a silver. Um, so it's hard to say that, you know, it's hard to say that he fits in this list. I think that, you know, I think that he has a higher ceiling than a CJ Spiller. I think he could be just a legit good running back that redshirted his, his first year. Um, he graded out really well in the prospect model. His grade is a 9.73, which is the highest prospect on this list by far. The next highest prospect is 8.8. So it's hard to say, you know, these guys aren't the same quality of prospect as Travis Etienne. He is in this elite range from in that 9.73 spot. The guys that are in the 9.5 to 9.99 range, so just before legendary, are Derrick Henry, Melvin Gordon, Trent Richardson, Joe Mixon, and Adrian Peterson. That is the cohort that he fits into. Almost all are bust proof besides Trent Richardson. All of them have top 12 seasons. I think ETN, before it's all said and done, has a top 12 season. I will say I will have a ton of ETN and redraft because it's an upside swing. It'll probably be cheaper. And the downside risk is there, but it'll only sting me for one season on one team. In Dynasty, I have a harder time. I was at the 412. His price is, dude, 412 is expensive. 412 is really expensive at this point. So again, I would lean sell. I wouldn't sell him for a bag of chips. But again, if I could get into the top five in this class, if I could get a 2023 first, Deontay Johnson or DJ Moore, if I could get into there, fine. If I could go from Travis Etienne and tear up, you know, Travis Etienne plus like a, a 108 or a 109 and get into, I don't know if this is possible. I didn't whip out the trade calculator for this because again, I compiled these all day. So I couldn't get super in depth with this breakdown, but I imagine you could do a Travis Etienne in like a 108 for something in the Javante Williams, DeAndre Swift, um, Brees Hall neighborhood. I could be wrong there, but I think you could. Um, but yeah, that's going to do it for us today. Those are all of our sophomore comps. Those are only, I think, five or six we went over today. I have literally every 2022 prospect in terms of ADP all the way back, or 2021 prospect, all the way back to Dwayne Eskridge. I literally have comps for Dwayne Eskridge. So if you want to check out all of the sophomore comps, I have literally all of them for every player all the way back to Dwayne Eskridge, my RS grades. I'm telling you, I'm compiling some really cool stuff on the back end of the Patreon right now in what I'm calling the RS grade library. It's still in its early stages, but it's going to be very cool. And eventually I'm going to kind of bump up the tiers because I'm putting so much work on the back end. I'm going to bump it up from like $5 to $8 and have some in-between tiers for Debbie stuff and other cool things. Um, so if you want to get in, you can get in for $5 and you will be grandfathered into that $8 tier. I'm going to be pretty much revamping the Patreon by around like NFL draft time, probably by the NFL draft. If not then, then maybe a week or two into May. Everybody that is on for $5 before I revamp things will stay on $5 in that $8 tier into perpetuity and will always be charged $5 for all the stuff I offer. So if you want to get in early, so you don't have to pay $8 or anything for any of the cool stuff I offer, feel free to check that out. Patreon.com slash Ron Stewart. If not, I completely, completely value anybody that wants to go out here. Give the boy a like, subscribe, comment down below. As always, I love you guys and I will see you in the next one. I got the juice, I got the juice. Ten oaks, Adam's on. Foolies, glad I'm on. Even my haters kind of glad I'm on. Rest in peace to my bag up on. Rapper, song, singer, suspended subpoena from Mr. Meaner.